There are millions of acres of opportunity out there. They belong to you. Every day, decisions are being made that affect your land, your water, your wildlife. You should know about them. This is your mountain. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Your Mountain Podcast. I'm your host, David Wilms, and I'm sitting with the illustrious Nephi Cole. What a beautiful morning. I've got fresh orange juice. Not that it's morning where you are. Or where we are. Oh, it's morning where we are. <laughs> we, but it might be afternoon or the beauty of the podcast. Whatever time of day it is, you know, good day to you. I hope it's been a been a great day. Going to be a great day I is twelve thirty a.m. Being a good one. Because or, the first person to listen to this, to email Dave Wilms, he will send the sweater he's wearing. You don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this one's pretty nice. You can't make fun of this one. How too old much. is it? I, you know, I'm just this, checking. I've probably had this one for less than a decade. Well done. And that's so this one of my newer items. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, so <yeah. laughs> give me a hard time about my my wardrobe and everything else. You love life. it though, don't you? Well, isn't it's it just, like it's like a part it's like of a me badge at this of honor. It's it, something at this like, point, yeah, it's almost everybody like, thinks it's mean to tease you about it. It's not. It's no, like I own it's it. like a pat on the back every time somebody does. It. It's like, wow, you're a cheapskate. You're like, thank you. Every time I see your wardrobe, I'm like, well, I'm retiring two years earlier than you are, just based on what you wear, because yeah. <laughs> I got money in the bank. <laughs> Uh, so my Louis Vuitton, <laughs> my Louis Vuitton Cryptek pants. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so Mike McGrady is is not with us today. Um, he'll be with us again. We know he'll be with us. Uh, he's with us in spirit, uh, but he can't can't join us this morning um, because it's morning and he's working uh, his day job. But we. Uh, we miss him. We'll see. We'll see him soon. So, Mike, I know you're listening to this, uh, sucker. You can't control us now. <laughs> We're going to say so much stuff that you're going to hate today, and there's nothing yeah. you can do to stop us. Good luck, legal guy. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, so let's uh, let's just jump right into it. Uh, you know, we've we've recorded a couple of these here at the uh, North American uh, Wildlife Management Conference here in Omaha, Nebraska, and. And I've said this. I'm going to say it again. The Wildlife and Natural Resources Conference. Sorry, Wildlife conference. and Natural Resources Conference. I've I know because on my bad. I've been coming to this thing forever, and I can't. I, I, can't, I can never say it right. Um, it's on my badge too. Yeah. What's your badge? Yeah. Uh, Eighty well, uh, fifth year. Eighty fifth year. I can't believe we let you in. Uh, I know, uh, but because <laughs> this is really it's one of the preeminent uh, gatherings of just unbelievable. Uh, dedicated conservationists from all over the country. Uh, and it's just so special to be here to get to sit next to people like Miles Moretti, who's joining us today from the Mule Deer Foundation. Good to be here. And uh, we, we thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to know if you brought any deer. No. Oh, dang it. <laughs> uh, this, this, I'm, just, I'm really excited about this. We've talked to you about doing one for a while now. And so it's just fun to be able to sit down with you. Um, you know, you, in in my eyes, you know, I, I like to think of myself as I'm still a rookie. I'm like <laughs> in the in the conservation community. Uh, like I'm still like in the minor leagues. We're sitting across from the College World Series. Like I feel like you know I'm I'm trying to work my way into that building, and here we're sitting next to Miles, who's like on his way into the Hall of Fame. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> um, so. Tell us a bit about yourself, and before we get into the yeah the Mayor yeah. Foundation. Well, you you both will appreciate this. I was I was born and raised in Wyoming. It's I haven't lived in Wyoming for a lot of years, but uh, my heart's still there. You can't you can't take that out of out of uh, somebody that's from Wyoming, and my family's all there. And I, I grew up hunting and and uh, not a lot of fishing because you know Southwest Wyoming's a little dry. But, uh, you know, mule deer and sage grouse were the two things that, that we hunted passionately. Uh, we, we, believe it or not, we didn't have a lot of antelope when I was a kid. They were all east, and they eventually moved into southwest Wyoming. And, and so it's ironic that as I went through my career, now working at mule deer, and then, of course, working on the listing of sage grouse and how that interaction could affect us and all that. I mean, those were the two things that I, I grew up on, but, but growing up in Southwest Wyoming was a great experience and, and, uh, you know, just being raised in rural, uh, Wyoming and, and the lifestyle and, 
you know, I worked for one of the largest domestic sheep uh, grazers in the in the world in the North America at the time in that area, and just the hard work that we we did growing up, and and then you know I ended up as I later and graduated from high school, I ended up at Utah State instead of Laramie. You know, it was because it was closer to my well, house. That's a good choice. Yeah, well, yeah. So yeah. People are very. He's a fellow Utah State. I know. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. We, there's a few Aggies from Wyoming. You know, uh, and, yeah, yeah. Evanston. Yeah, Evanston. <laughs> yeah, <that>. yeah, Evanston. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and so I ended up there, and that's where I ended up uh, in Utah for, and ended up with a career at, with the wildlife agency there. I, I I do always remember though, in uh, in high school, they wanted to, what what do you want to be someday. And my what I wrote down was director of Wyoming Game and Fish, <laughs> so I never made that. But uh, that was always early on, and and I went into I always knew I wanted to go into wildlife, you know, based on my background and and all the hunting that we did as a kid. So so I you know, and then the rest is you know kind of history. I spent thirty years with the wildlife agency doing a lot of different things, and and then fourteen years ago came to the Mule Deer Foundation. You know, we know Governor Gordon fairly well and uh Brian State Nesvick's, of Wyoming governor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean Nesvik might be slacking on the job a little bit if you want us to put in a word for you. Could, <laughs> yeah, as far as Wyoming governor. You know, that might be the one job that pulls me out of retirement just so I could film fulfill my my bucket list from when I was a kid. But but Brian's doing a great job, so I, I oh yeah. So but uh yeah, and just just in you know, now now I'm kind of looking at uh you know you talk about a legacy and looking back and stuff but i'm my legacy too is my my grandkids and i want to make sure that that they they get this ethic of conservation and hunting and fishing and and the outdoors so so uh, bef- I, I i want to talk a lot about what you've done with yeah. the mule deer foundation but you just glossed over a 30-year history with, <laughs> with, with uh, the agency in Utah, and I'm curious, you know, what you know, what kind of things did you work on you know, during the course of your career there? Are there any, any things that, that really stand out that you're really proud of that you were able to be a part of during that time? Sure. You know, the I started out, you know, just like a lot of people as a seasonal tech and then, you know, became permanent and, and working for the agency, and I was, I was, a, I was a biologist to start with, and and a couple of the, you know, real neat accomplishments is, you know, just some of the projects you got to work on, some of the endangered species. I was a non-game guy for a while, and, and I was a regional supervisor. But one of the things that highlighted is I banded the first bald eagle chick to be produced in Utah in over 50 years. It really? was on the Colorado River in a cottonwood tree, and uh, we watched that, that nest, and and uh, crawled up in the nest and, you know, wanted to see what kind of things they were eating because of the desert and the river. And there was a prairie dog and a carp <laughs> in the nest. And uh, we so had... So it was doing a good job. Yeah, we had a TV, we had, we had a TV camera there and everything and recording it. So that was kind of kind of cool to, to be part of that little bit of history. But, but, you know, the other thing is, is when I was regional supervisor, we pretty much ran the state uh, bighorn sheep program restoration program in in that for the whole state just because our guys had experience in it so rebuilding those bighorn sheep herds and uh, now you know i may draw a tag one of these days now and and built elk the elk herds that we built through across the state we didn't have a lot of elk when when i first started and really really expanding that and building that and then and then just then i moved into the into headquarters after 20 years in the field and and then getting involved in the politics and the policy and being at the legislature and and learning how to deal in that arena i mean i had no idea you know how how complex you know legislation was and and at the time that i was there our legislature wasn't really friendly to the wildlife agency is we see that around the West, but uh, but building those relationships and and in starting to come to the national meetings and being involved in, in in all the things that go on, like meetings like this. My first my first North American was in two thousand one in Washington D.C., and that was a pretty much a culture shock for me. I came from rural southern southeast Utah. All of a sudden, I'm in Washington D.C. and 
And uh, so, you know, a lot of the stuff on the national level, um, you know, and then as I went to the Mule Deer Foundation, you know, being able to take that experience and, and work on the national level, national topics and things. And uh, and a lot of those relationships you build when you're young, those individuals are now leaders in this in this community. And you can go, you know, and you have that background. So I always tell people, build those relationships. Don't burn your bridges. Build those relationships because you never know where you're going to end up or where they're going to end up. And that's really something that's paid dividends. I think, I mean, that's a, that's an unbelievable lesson. I tell that to, I, I teach a class uh, adjunct. Actually, they don't let me call myself an adjunct faculty at the University of Miami. I have to call myself a part-time temporary lecturer. I'm looking to get promoted to adjunct. There you uh, go. But I tell my students that all the time, uh, that exact same message yeah. of, you know, you just can't burn your bridges. I don't care how many people there are in this country. Yeah. When you get into this, the work that we do, uh, you know, you that world all shrinks. Again. That yeah. world shrinks. Yeah. yeah. And you're going to run into all the same people all over the place. All over. And yeah. you're going to need somebody someday to help. You're going to yeah. need an ally somewhere on something you didn't realize you did. And it's, yeah, so it's so critical. Yeah. yeah. And you know, you've just, been around a long time. When you're at a meeting and an old guy walks up and says, I was your seasonal back in 1971. <laughs> and you're gone. <laughs> you know, but they said, thank you for, you know, the experiences and, you know, and uh, and I just – I have to thank some of those because I had some amazing seasonals that taught me stuff, you know. Like I had a seasonal once taught me how to trap bears, you know, and, it, and that's one of the things if you remember is – he says, you got to get down on the ground. you got to think like a bear and walk like a bear. And he'd walk like a bear into the trap, you know, and stuff. And I thought, wow, what? I just learned something today. You know, I thought, you know, I was the boss of yeah. the project, you know. And and that kid now is, guy is now in Idaho is one of their top researchers and stuff. And so you, ne- you never know what, what, what impact you're going to have. Well, and think back to that, I mean, that bald eagle story you told. How many eagles are there in Utah now? Do you know? Yeah. I don't know. There's probably 20 nests or something, 25 nests. I don't know. But that's but that's nesting, right? And then yeah, you have yeah. eagles that are migrating Yeah, through. the winter. A lot of a lot of birds winter yeah. there. And that's what happened. I think that bird came down in winter there and just ended up, you know, finding a mate and stayed. You know, but but we didn't do anything. It was came naturally. But, but you were working, you know, when I'm, I guess you didn't tell us the exact time, but I'm guessing based on your description of your your career timeline. It was in the eighties. Okay. 80s. Yeah. So we're we're talking. We had just figured out what was killing all these eagles less yep. than a decade earlier, yep. and we're trying to respond. And so we were yep. still, uh, it was still pretty tenuous at the time. Yeah, we were looking hard, not so much for bald eagles. We were surveying hard for peregrine falcons, and you know we had some historic iries that were in in the uh, in the, in south, south southeastern Utah, Lake Powell. And but there hadn't been an active nest for years, and we were doing surveys for that. When that's kind of how we found that nest is is we were looking for peregrines, and uh, and we were starting to find some then. They were uh, there was a you know a lot of hacking programs where they were putting chicks on towers around the country and stuff, and and of course you know we knew that DDT was impacting peregrines, but yeah, when we were finding some of the first. N- natural nests reestablished in utah during that time so a lot of a lot of fun things going on back then um and things that we you know today people go oh peregrine falcons bald eagles are everywhere well there was a time when they weren't you know and and it was only because of the recovery efforts and a lot of work of of the agencies across north america that we we now have that so. it's kind of funny when <clears throat> do you say that because it's like i think Dave probably feels like me. I mean, I kind of, I was lucky enough to grow up in an era where we didn't have that level, that that scarcity never came to mind. Oh, yeah. And so now we are dealing with some of the problems when we you know, when we talk about raptors. We're dealing with some of the problems of conflict because we have so many. Like we have yeah. so many more than we did. Oh. And now they're like, oh, well, not that these are everywhere. They turns out they run into stuff or they're <laughs> whatever else. Yeah. These are new yeah. challenges. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I spent, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours not looking at nothing at the sky, you know. Same thing after they discovered black-footed ferrets in, in Matitsi. 
we had to survey for black-footed ferrets and spent hours and hours never seeing them. And only when later when they were reintroduced into different places uh, are they there and established now. And, and again, talk about a highlight. One of my highlights was going to Matitsi and seeing black-footed ferrets in the wild. Did you go up for the, the release? Um, the re-release? The re-release? No, no, I didn't. I wished I would have. But, but that was – we went up there and learned how to survey for them. Okay. And you're – shining a spotlight and seeing those little guys come out of the out of the prairie dog holes yeah. and so, so one of the highlights that you talk about um ferrets one of the highlights of my career has been uh this and this will make this will make you feel old <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things I'm make sorry, me feel old sorry <laughs> i don't mean to do this to you uh but but you know when they were all pulled out of the wild because of the distemper mm-hmm. and the fear yeah. that they were going to lose them all back in uh in the early 80s there were 18 of them yeah and they all went to the sabil canyon research facility which is this game and why game and fish run facility um north of north of laramie yeah um and as a elementary school student at the time (laughs) (laughs) there you go that's where i was gonna i know i know as an elementary school student at the time we took a field trip up there uh to see these ferrets and and so They'd been there for a year or two. They hadn't. I think they'd had their first litter. They'd find. They'd finally figured out how to do the captive yeah. breeding and make it work. Yeah, I remember. But there that. were still very, very few. Uh, but there were enough that they were willing to take one out of the. Because if you remember that, I mean, that was. I think it was an airtight type of facility. They didn't want any pathogens. They didn't want. I mean, they were trying to protect these things. Really, it was getting to the point where okay, they felt comfortable enough that they had a. a Game and fish personnel that was able to Play handle handle one. So I have mm-hmm. this picture of me in elementary school on this field trip with this game and fish biologist holding this ferret. That's cool. Fast forward, yeah. Uh, and in the course of uh, of two years, um, fast forward thirty years, and I I had the opportunity when I was working for the governor's office to go up to the re-release of mm-hmm. ferrets. Um, on the Pitchfork Ranch up yeah. there out of Matitsi, where right. they put them back, where that's right. where they were they ta- they were yeah. taken. Yeah. And then a year later, um, because I had talked to the folks at the Fish and Wildlife Service and told them this experience I had as a kid, they invited me to do a release to release a ferret of my own oh, uh, cool. in Colorado. That's so cool. I I went down and and released a ferret in Colorado. And now I don't tell you I teach this class. I bring those. The folks from the ferret center there in in Colorado, they come to my class every year and bring a live ferret to That's display cool. to the students there. Yeah, so because yeah. I want to pay yeah. for my experience with yeah. black and ferret. Don't you have yeah. a similar story about wolves where you get to release a wolf in Colorado? Isn't <laughs> <laughs> that no? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, Damn. I don't. Damn you! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Don't put that's unneeded a, things on my resume. That's, that's a joke. Just so we're all clear. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, so there's my. I, just, I mean, that's pretty cool, you know, to see that from from a species that we thought was extinct. I mean, those are the memories that I have of my early career and stuff is working on those kind of things that that you know weren't maybe that glitzy or glamorous. We didn't have the media and all that kind of stuff quite like we do today, but but it made a big difference, you know, and, and, and seeing that stuff today. So that, that's kind of some fond memories I have. Well, that's neat. I, I mean, I love the story about, you know, all the, the effort and work and teaching and, and development of expertise it takes to do all those things, including you talked about finding ferrets. I have a question for you. How come it's so hard to find mule deer? <laughs> Why? I, I don't Why know. Is it so hard? I don't know, Dave. You and I find them pretty easy. I know. Don't I we? don't know. I've never had this problem. <laughs> yeah, I've never had that problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've seen your pictures. You've seen mine. Yeah, right? I mean, yeah. We, uh, we find mule deer. Yeah. What's, no, what's like, going on here, Nephi? <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe think, we need to start asking you questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I, I got to. I would be honest to say, I've, I've, I've had the opportunity to take a couple of nice mule deer. But the funny part is, I feel like when I hunt elk. I kind of un- I get it. Yeah. I get it. And mule deer are a mystery to me. It's like yeah. when I run, it's like I oh hey, you know. Whereas like an elk, I'm like oh that's where I'm gonna find it. And then mule deer, I'm just kind of like. Yeah. Yeah. But I bring the, I say this again. Thing. You say you know you get it without. Why don't you kill any elk then? This guy. <laughs> <laughs> this guy. Uh, I don't know. So, but no, I mean, I mean, growing up, you know, it's interesting growing up in Southwest Wyoming when we were hunting mule deer. We were the only ones hunting there. I mean, there was nobody else, and and it was like 
they they weren't that mysterious because they weren't hunted that hard, you know. They weren't pressured year round. They weren't harassed for their antlers, you know, dropping antlers and and photo being photographed. They they were really left alone, you know. And 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 to be honest with you, back then, with all the predator control that went on, they were they were abundant, you know. Do you think predator control has an effect on those populations? I, I do. I do. I I I saw what. I always say I wrote a, a chapter in Boone and Crockett's mule deer book, and I was said I was I was grew up in the golden age of mule deer. I was born in the early fifties, and I you know coming through the fifties, sixties, seventies in Wyoming, and seeing those numbers. But you got to remember, we didn't have freeways through high eighty wasn't built yet. We we had lots of domestic sheep on the range, and we were using ten eighty. We you know. I mean, killing coyotes and cougars and bears, and we had no ravens. We had no – I mean, there was hardly any – you'd occasionally see a golden eagle maybe. But but because back in those days, wildlife services at the time, I think they had a different name then. I mean, we had a friend that was a government trapper, and, you know, he – he used to fly a super cub by himself and shoot coyotes with the other with one hand out of the plane. Second best agency yeah. in the federal government. Yeah. APHIS. Yeah. And they were they were you know, I mean so and then you were converting from grasslands to sagebrush and you know, there was a perfect storm during the fifties and sixties and and I grew up in that era and, and that's why but today think about that, you know. We we don't control predators as much. We have more predators on the landscape. We have highways everywhere. We have subdivisions. We have our own hunters are harassing deer 365, trail cams, out there trying to photograph, out there trying to collect their shed antlers and trying to run deer and elk to get them to drop their antlers. And, and you know, it's no wonder, you know, the, the deer and, and elk and, you know, elk are much more hardy, but... But it's no wonder our deer numbers are down, you know. So, so you feel like that that level of harassment has an effect on the population? I, I think it has to. It has to do it. I mean, you know, they're, especially that the people that are out there on the winter range, those deer are literally starving to death once they go into winter. That I mean, all the reserves they had to put on, the sagebrush they're eating are just maintaining and they're just going. But, but you know having people chase them having us hunt long seasons is i think hurts you know it it just never gives those animals a chance anymore to to be secure and and i i think a lot that's a lot of factors that have contributed you know, i mean a lot of others fires habitat highways all those things do you so. think the the uh so i, I think utah's done this uh, i know wyoming's done this it, in certain places they're now creating shed hunting seasons. Yes, trying yeah. trying to yeah. minimize I was the disturbance. The exact same question. Well, trying to minimize disturbance yep. on winter range and and postponing it, yep. you know, and, and trying to not affect with you know affect when they're you know, giving birth to young and that sort mm. of thing. Do you think that's had an effect? Are people in what you're seeing? Well, one, two questions, I guess, is are people adhering to that law? And two, or or those regulations? And two, do you think it's having a a, a positive effect for deer? I think it's like everything else. I th- I've seen cases where people have gone out and found a bunch of sheds early and st- stockpiled them, you know, and stuff. And I, I think that's minimal. I, I I think it's helped in that it's it's given them a breather a little bit longer, the animals. Because we were seeing across the West, and not just in Utah where, where I live, but, you know, people were driving four-wheelers out into the into the over the sagebrush and not only harassing the the deer but they were damaging you know the, the you know they were doing grids in, out in the sagebrush you know with a four wheeler and running over sagebrush and stuff and and uh you know and then we've lots of an- stories about people chasing deer through the juniper and stuff to get them to knock off their antlers or something you know even elk too and and that harassment is not as much there uh, but but you know I think I, it's definitely got to help. And uh, yes, so. this is a policy discussion that we're having in you know that, that we've had in with government agencies and others. You know, talking about this concept of you know when we take a you know you take you put pressure on an animal when you're out there with a with a tag. Um, kind of the discussion back and forth was well that's you should have to pay for that because we're going to take that animal. Well, that's a take. And then so the point came up. We, there were some folks. There was a bill. 
in a state that was going to require, you know, it was it was going to limit the amount. You know, basically had to have a tag if you wanted to go shed hunt. You would, you would have to have a tag. And then the argument from the people who weren't doing it is, well, we're not we're not hurting the animals. We're not taking the animals. The argument from on the other side was, wait a minute, when you're degrading that animal, that animal's having to run from you. You are. You know, you're, you are affecting that animal just like a hunter, whether or not he's going to get the animal or not. You're, you know, that animal could die. You're responsible for that. Shouldn't you have to pay into that if you're going to be out? Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's, you know, that is a much more of a social issue. Uh, I don't know if it's biological, but, you know, having people, if you're going to have a shed season, you might as well get some funds to help administer it and educate i think the biggest thing on shed hunting is the education ethics courses that a lot of people are making uh, a lot of states are making you go watch um and i think there needs to be more of that i think i think we just have to remind people you know it's it's you know even though there's this frenzy frenzy to be the first one out there you know get that find those sheds and you know and there's some value to those sheds there's a lot of value yeah these so days. Yeah. i think that the state's you know, because of their management and all the other things, should be able to recoup some cost somehow. Now, whether that's a license or whatever, I don't know, a stamp or something. But, but you know, it there's definitely impact there. And uh, I think I think the biggest thing is trying to de- teach people. And you can't teach ethics, you know, but you can kind of remind people and refresh people's minds about, hey, think about this when you're out there. So... I want to back. I, I hate to interrupt this kind of discussion, but I want to back up uh, just a little bit because we're, we're starting to get into the type of we're getting into mule deer, and I feel like we missed the transition from Utah Wildlife <laughs> to the Mule Deer to Foundation, CEO of the Mule Deer Foundation, yeah. and and so it, you know, tell us when you when you I know you told us when you started there, but maybe take us back when you started there. What mule found it? You'll give us some of the history of the Mule Deer Foundation sure. and some of the sure. some of the things you do, and then and then we'll get back into all this kind of discussion. Yeah, when I retired in in two thousand six, I well, I was looking to to retire and do something else. I was young enough, and I had several opportunities and uh, um, for different organizations. But the Mule Deer Foundation said, "Hey, our headquarters are in an office in Reno. Not a big deal. We can we're just renting space. We we could move." the headquarters to Salt Lake. In fact, we had a company that was, before I came on, that was going to build a building for us, and that ended up falling through. Uh, but uh, so when I hired, my, they said, you can move the headquarters to Salt Lake City. So that was great. I didn't have to move. You know, I retired and uh, and was one day and two days. Uh, I retired on a Friday. Uh, I took Saturday as a day to retire. And October 1 of 2006, I started with the Mule Deer Foundation. And I walked in the door in Reno on that Monday morning, and uh, and the organization, frankly, was really struggling. And I, I tell a lot of people, if I'd have known how how much of a struggle MDF was going through, I probably wouldn't have taken the job. Because here I am, a state guy that, you know, running a nonprofit's way different than working for the state government. They say, what's the difference? I said, if you don't – it's state government, I had a budget. In an NGO, if you don't raise the money, you can't keep the doors open. So that was my first challenge is, is fiscally to get the organization on track. Secondly, the organization had a, a history of not fulfilling their promises to habitat projects and funding to the states and to other partners just because of their financial situation. So I, I did do what I called an apology tour for the first two years and went out and and talked to people and said I'm committed to to meet our obligation, and if we fail to to fund a project, and a lot of them said no, that's history. But in the future, let's make sure that you know you follow through, and then build a new organization. When I came in, there was there was about uh, twelve people that were working for the organization, and we had our fundraisers were scattered over multiple states running lots of banquets and so I had to start start from scratch from that end. I had I had the conservation background. I had thirty years. So building the relationships in this community was much easier than building the relationships and the funding base and finding the diverse funding to help our organization grow. And so, you know, 
that was my biggest challenge and getting the credibility back of the organization and then making the organization relevant. We weren't showing up. We didn't have anybody at the important meetings at the AWCP at the, you know, I'm now a professional member of Boone and Crockett and, and all those kind of things that, that you need to be in this community and those partnerships. We had no government affairs, uh, a presence in Washington, D.C., and there was a lot of legislation that was impacting mule deer and the West the West in general. And uh, so uh, there was a lot of balls to juggle, you know, to build a structure, to build the organization, but yet, you know, get us relevant. And, and as I told people, the way I got us relevant was I just showed up everywhere. I just went to every meeting, every, you know, and we talk about – uh, building relationships, it was hard to get in the door because in some ways we have a little bit of a closed community mm-hmm. and, you know, you know, little groups. And, and you know, when you showed up, it was like, you're the new kid. You're Who are you? You haven't earned your way in here yet. But, but I go back to those relationships that I had earlier. Some of those people were in leaderships and helped open the door and get me in. And then we had to start performing, and, and which we have. We we had our best year in 31 years. Um, you know, we started in 1988 in California. Our still our number one state for membership is California. Believe it or not, that, that actually and it's, really and it's surprises our, me. And it's our number one fundraising state. Uh, those people all hunt somewhere else. That's. I went to a meeting there once, and and people said, "Why should we support you at a national group?" And not a state local group, which we have a couple out there now, you know, Wyoming, Arizona, California. And I said, how many of you guys hunt out of state? Everybody in the room raised their hand, said we hunt out of state. I said, that's why you need a national mule deer group. You need somebody who's fighting for you across the West. You know, that's great. The state groups are great, but they only pretty much are limited to their state. And and they find also that, you know, the first thing we hear is, well, all the money goes to Salt Lake City. No. Well, it technically comes to the bank in Salt Lake City. And but it goes, goes out of the But places. it goes back out. And they said, well, you're, you're, you know, you're not putting enough money on the ground. We put 70 percent of the money on the ground. We put 80 percent of the money on the ground. And I, and I go, yeah, but we we do a lot more than just put it on the ground. I mean, you know that – Government relations is not cheap, but it's important. You know, you have to do a lot of different things. And they say things like, well, we don't produce a magazine. We don't do all this. And I go, yeah, but that's that's, we're, that's how one of the ways we get out out to our membership and, and, and being able to go across the nation. We have members in all 50 states and some states bigger than others. We have chapters in non-mule deer country because those people come to, to – uh, the West to hunt mule deer. And everywhere I travel, everybody goes, I want to kill a mule deer. I haven't killed a mule deer. I want to hunt a mule deer. And I see that a lot. And so but we have we have chapters in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, state of Pennsylvania, Atlanta, Georgia, Missouri. We got now five chapters in Minnesota, not a, not a mule deer in any of those. But they send their money out West. Yeah, and the hunters come out. I mean, you mentioned yeah. it when you mentioned California. I know the industry that I work in, you know, the, the firearms world. The uh, I was talking with one of our uh, the, uh, gentlemen who makes um, the guys from who, who makes firearms, and he said, you know, California is still their largest market. Yeah, you know, he the, he's a, this is a guy who who lives in Wyoming, but he said, you know, where we're the people who are coming out here who are buying firearms, that's still. Their biggest market, and that, that may not be the same for every company, but it's just a realization that even though that political environment has become difficult for those folks, they still live there, mm-hmm. and they still value the opportunity to uh, come out and, you know, to free America. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what will blow you away is, you know, we have banquets all over the country, and if you go to one, a Mule Deer Foundation banquet or whoever – they may have four or five, six guns at a, at a banquet, the auction, raffle, whatever. In California, if you don't have a minimum of 70 guns at your banquet, they're mad. And they're saying, we're not coming back because Elk Foundation has 70 or California Waterfowl has 70. 
I mean, it's amazing my first time. And the raffle drums are huge because they raffle them. They don't auction very few of them <laughs> because every, everybody buys these huge packs of raffle tickets and just, and, but you see a gun board with 70 guns in California and you think, really? Uh, you know, with all the when restrictions you're, they you're have for the doors to get kicked in. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Right. Well, well, but but then there's dumb things like we cannot. We love to put uh, our logo on a pistol grip, the wood grip, and then put them have them on the gun. Mm-hmm. We can't do that in California. That's considered a modification. Yes. So we have to send the gun with the <laughs> with the original grips and the MDF grips. To California, if they want to, if they want to change the grips. A few years ago, California had to have a, a button on the ARs. Yes. Uh, only state. And then they the said. The bullet button. Yeah, the bullet button. And then they decided not to have it. We got stuck with some bullet <laughs> button <laughs> ARs <laughs> that we couldn't sell because only, no, but they changed the rule in California. But it, that is an interesting part of the business that the sometimes, you know, I love the conservation part, but sometimes dealing with the, the regulations and the raffle laws and all that stuff across the country, it really is different. Well, so. you wouldn't, you wouldn't think from, from the outside, you know, you go and you buy your ticket and you show up to a banquet and you yeah. have a good time and you wouldn't think about, yeah, you know, all of the, the politics involved and, and, yeah. Yeah. and you know, with, putting on a banquet that yeah. you're competing with other banquets yeah. and you have to make your, yours yeah. one that, People are willing to stand, out. stand yeah. out and they want to go to and then, then you gotta deal with potential yeah. you know, state regulations on Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, it's that's uh that's something that I don't think many people think about when they when they show up to a banquet. Well I never thought I'd be, you know, doing those kind of things and you know, that kind of stuff or you know, our Western Hunting and Conservation Expo that's our big convention every year in Salt Lake City, that I would be a, a show producer booking entertainment, uh uh, you know, writing scripts for for a, a, a show and producing videos and and that's the part of the Mule Deer Foundation job I just never thought. I thought I was coming to be a biologist at the Mule Deer Foundation, and I get to do all that, a lot of that. But you know, that that's the part of the of of the NGOs that a lot of people don't see. So I I've heard, and maybe you can maybe internet. You know, you can find people who are grumpy about everything. I've heard I I have read people grumpy about the Western Hunting Expo. Why? What's the beef? Uh, uh, well, a lot of two th- there's two items. A lot of people don't like the state auction tags. They think that that puts people at the head of the line, you know. I mean, I have 24 desert bighorn sheep tags, and I can't, you know, I I'm never going to be able to afford, you know, a 30, 40, 80,000 dollar desert sheep tag. But you know what? I don't begrudge those guys that do that because that's their way of giving back to conservation. 93% of the money that we raise on auction tags goes back to the state wildlife agencies. And the reason it's 93% is because some states require 100% to go back, Arizona and Nevada. Uh, California requires 5%. Uh, a lot of the states give you 10%. And all that money goes back to all – the only state that didn't go back on the ground for the species it raised it was California, and we got together with a bunch of sportsmen and changed that legislation so it has to be spent not just in their general fund. It goes back to habitat. It goes back to management. It goes back to research. And so, But a lot of people just don't like that. The big issue is the 200 tags that the state of Utah lets us draw there. Now, we get to keep part of the application fees for overhead but a lot of that money goes back on the ground and a lot of people think those 200 tags have come out of the drawing and that their odds are reduced and when you're like me i got 24 sheet points i you know to take one tag out of out of the general drawing i'm saying it reduces my odds it's pretty minuscule but the money raised is and the draw economically to the expo because you have to come there to to validate your application and you know and then the state sells the tag i mean you still have to buy the tag from the state but so that that's a big controversy so, it's because of, so i mean yeah. so basically it's because a, a small percentage of tags there's a you know 200 yeah 200 tags out of how many several thousand i don't know how many utah has but so there's yeah. the, the draw process occurs there at the at the hunting just expo. just for those 200 yeah. and then so you need to be there for that just to just to validate your application yep. not for the drawing but but and you know and and so there's controversy there and and a few years ago you know the elk foundation 
applied to get the contract to run the 200 tags, not the expo. That's what a lot of people are confused. The expo belongs to us, uh-huh. to us and, and sportsmen for fish and wildlife. But, but, you know, and the state took our bid and some people didn't like that. And there was a lot of controversy. And, and frankly, it caused some heartburn between us and, and the Elk Foundation that, that, you know, and, but we've repaired that. They're great partners. We give them money. They give us money. But all that was generated a lot by the chat forums. And if on those forums, as you guys know, there's probably 10 people that run a majority of the stuff that are talking. And so, you know, they accused us of all kinds of things and stuff. And the attorney general, you know, everybody's looked at the legislature. We go through audits every year. But there's a lot of people that just oppose that kind of process, selling state auction tags and and taking some tags out of the general drawing. So so your partners with that, with the Sportsman's for Fish and Wildlife. Yes, yes. How did that partnership come about? Well, it was a dream that we would actually bring a big expo together of, of Wild Sheep Foundation, Rocky Mountain Elk, National Wild Turkey Federation, SFW, and, and Mule Deer Foundation. And it, uh, it pretty well, pretty soon realized that there were a lot of big egos in the room at that time. Uh, I wasn't there at the time, so I can say that. But there were a lot of big egos in the room, and a lot of people didn't want to share the limelight. So two of the groups, NWTF, who had a big national convention, and RMEF, who had, a, had at the time had a, their elk, elk camp, camp. They decided that that didn't work for them, so they said we're 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 not going to do it. But SFW, us, and Wild Sheep Foundation said no. We think we can make this work, and so we we were together for three years. And then Wild Sheep says we're kind of losing our identity. We'd like to go back out on our own, and it's been good for them to go back out on their own. So in uh, after three years, that was just SFW and us. We're both there in Utah. SFW is now only a state of Utah group, and uh, uh, you know we're, we're we're a national group. I hope that's not ringing. That's only no. ringing through my ears. But uh, <laughs> sorry about that. But uh, you know, so then we that first year after Wild Sheep left, I didn't think the expo was going to survive. I mean, it was tough. That was, you know, and that was right when the economy went down. You know. 08, 09, mm-hmm. 10. You know, we were in that, still in that real down economic cycle. We were given booth space away. We were given night tickets away. You know, we just come to our expo, you know. But then everybody learned to love it. And what they say about us, we have wide aisles because we have a lot of families. We bring a lot of kids. You go to a lot of these national conventions and there's no young people there. And the family feel and everything and people are I mean, we're we're expanding every year just because uh, people are selling and people are liking seeing all the youth that we have and all the youth activities. So, but long story short, yeah, a lot of people don't like some parts of what of what we do there. So, so and and maybe you guys, I don't know if you've gotten criticism because of this, but. I, I think that the the chatter that I read, nobody ever says stuff that you know about. Nobody says bad things about Mule Deer Foundation that I know, um, but I think that your partner in that um, mm-hmm. that endeavor, Sports Fish and Wildlife, um, maybe they've gotten a black eye in some other areas. What's your perspective on that? Because that's, I mean, when I read it, I mean, that's who they point to. I was like, oh yeah, this is this is that group, this expo. That's why we hate this expo is because of this group. So why the why? What's the what's the history with the bitterness? Anything you can talk about on that? Um, I think when they expanded some of their chapters to some other states and tried to go to other states, they had some people in those chapters that maybe, you know, did said, said and did a lot of things that weren't. You know, they didn't want to really work together. They kind of had their own agenda. And in Utah, there were some issues with some of their leaders at the time. But I can tell you right now, in the last three years, since Troy Justison's been their president, he's one of the finest individuals I've ever met. And uh, he is really turning that organization around. And their board has said, we're not going to jump in and be the controversial. And we're not going to try to, you know, a lot of the tag issues were... SFW was part of that lead and in getting those tags, you know, even though those tags are still there, but their attitude's different, the way they work, uh, you know, and the way, you know, the partnerships that they're developing. So it's, it, it's the organization itself that's changed, 
but everybody has a long memory, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, and, and, you know, so early on they deserve some of that controversy, but, but today I can tell you they're a much different organization and a great partner. Yeah. It's funny that you say that. I mean, there are other groups out there right now, you know, that I think there, there's some great groups that are, um, the hunting community that have gotten some flack in the past. There'll probably be some that'll get some flack in the future. Um, but you're right when you say people have a long memory. There's that danger with leadership, right? Yeah. Where yeah. leadership decides to do something or somebody says something and then the entire organization becomes, you know, whatever that guy said, mm-hmm. whatever that guy did. Um, yep. Yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, you have to be careful anymore if, uh, you know, if you post something personally on Facebook, oh, yeah. nobody separates you from your organization. And we've had that challenge with some of our, our field directors. And, you know, they've got on Facebook and said some stuff. And and immediately I get a phone call. The Mule Deer Foundation against this? No, no. That that, what, that person was, you know, yeah. posting as, uh, you know, as their own yeah, self. You, but You have to remember that, that yeah. these people are just people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but once you're part of an organization or belong to a state or whatever, when you, you know, I mean, everybody knows who we work for. And if you post something controversial it's the it's your boss's fault yeah yeah it's your organization is that your position now no (laughs) well that kind of brings that's a good lesson though that's a good lesson for people um absolutely right you're going right where i want to go (laughs) there's you know we've had so with those groups if if you remember one of these groups you know something to remember we had a we dave and i both when we worked for governor the you know the governor's office we would be in these meetings and somebody would stand up who was a member or even a member of a state chapter for a given group Mm -hmm. and they would and they would rail on a bill you know and they would you know and the legislature they'd be hey i'm teddy this dude and I represent the door makers of America and then he would go off and, 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 and then he would say how much he hated this thing or that thing. And the assumption of that everybody in that room is, oh, this must be the position of the group, you know, mm-hmm. the, of the legislature and literally for years and the damage is the damage is ongoing. It has not been fixed. You know, somebody does something six years ago and that group cannot get in the door and get credence with the legislative right. body or an executive right. because one dude acted like he represented the position of a group when in reality yeah the group didn't have a position yeah the group hadn't taken a stance that guy took a stance right but it poisoned the water for every for for legitimate activities that that group would want to do in the future and I, and that's a, a a big thing is some of the some groups let their state affiliates be much more independent uh, we've not let our local chapters be – they're not their own 501c3 like some are and stuff. We, that, we control that narrative. Now, if there's a local issue that they want to talk about and it doesn't go against what we're doing nationally, then I'll just say go to the meeting as the local MDF or I'll have our regional director go and say this is our position of our local chapter of – you know. Because everybody's issues are different, you know, and 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 that is that is a big big thing. People people have a hard time separating, you know, the, you know they they think because they're a local chapter of MDF, they can all of a sudden speak for the organization, yeah, like right? National yeah, policy, right? Yeah, and and you're like, whoa, whoa, there's a lot more going on here, and we've got these other relationships and and stuff. So, uh, uh, you know, but that's you know, but I love passionate volunteers. I mean, you know, when it's when our volunteers do that, I I always say, hey, you know, I appreciate the passion, but you got to understand, you know, the organization. And the other thing that it's a little bit off, but everybody wants MDF to be their advocate. And the first thing I ask somebody is, are you a member? Well, no, but I want you to, you know, go get fight this legislative bill or go fight this county commission planning and zoning. And I'm going. Have you ever been part of our organization? Have you ever contributed? You know, I mean, if it's an issue that we feel that's important to us, I mean, I have this thing. If it's bad for mule deer, we're against it, you know. And But, you know, you have to temper that too. But, but you know, you just can't be everybody's advocate. And I'm amazed how, how people want us to be their advocate all the time. Well, 
in some ways, though, that you should take that as a compliment. I, I right? guess, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I'm like, okay, I don't know you. <laughs> <laughs> but you're viewed as a as an effective leader in the space. I think so, and I, yeah. and I, you're right. That is a good way to take it. But you gotta, and you know, in some cases, um, you know, people come around and say, yeah, I'll join your group. Oh, yeah, I, I, you know, and you, when you explain what you can and can't do, you know, and and uh, you know, and we've had some people leave our group because they didn't agree with the position we took, but that's okay. I mean, you know, uh, we got to look out what's best. My job is to look out for what's best for Mule Deer Foundation. And that's what my board wants me to do. And sometimes that doesn't jive with some of the people that have come and joined and left or people that have broke off and done another group that want to go a different direction. So, you know, yeah, you know, I wanted to give an example <clears throat> Excuse me. I wanted to give an example of uh, of this. We were talking just a second ago about the the actions that you have and 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 how they can have these long standing mm-hmm. consequences. And it can take Nephi was saying how it can you know in our experience there the, several years to undo damage. It's not several years. Uh, you know, it's sometimes out here in the West. <laughs> Generations. It's generations. <laughs> generations. You, know, you hear these stories. I've had that experience. I have too. You hear the stories. You're talking to a, a rancher and say, I can't stand my neighbor. I can't stand you. Know, and you, you're like, well, what, what's, what's wrong? What's, what's going on? Well, my great, great grandfather, <laughs> you know, yeah, and, and, and they tell the story about what the, you know, the great, great grandfather's experience with the you're neighbor. Right. You're and, totally right. And, like so, what's your beef now? Oh, I don't talk to him. I don't. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had I had a great example of that when I was with the wildlife agency. I was in the director's office, and and I got sent to a part of the state that I hadn't really worked in, so I didn't really know the landowners or anything. And and I would talk to this landowner, and he just railed on us, uh, you know, on me, and just beat me up. I think it was over elk or something, you know, the issue depredation. And and finally, I looked at him and I go, "This has nothing to do with elk, right?" He goes, no, your <laughs> warden in, in 1968 wrote my grandfather a ticket, <laughs> and he hated the game and fish ever since. And I was like, I, I can't help you. There's no, there's no, yeah, there's no, we're just going to be in different places. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I could just tell the issue had nothing to do with what I was there talking to him about. It's absolutely true. And I mean, and I think that I, I don't even. I don't really think about it, but it's, it makes perfect sense. I mean, in the West, you know, a lot of us, we, you know, and a lot of people like you, you, they think of this as transitional, you know, they come in, they come out, they moved here from someplace else. They're moving someplace else next year. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the people, the foundational fixtures, whether it's the legislators in many cases, or whether it's those landowners that are so critical, you got people who like, they ain't moving. This no. is foundational to them, everything that's going on here. And so when you come and you attack their way of life or their, right. their paradigm of thinking, and it, you know, for us, if we're like, oh, I'm just going to – now I'm going to go watch a movie. They don't. You know, they yeah. go back to work and yeah. they you – know, on that spot, you know, in that dirt, yeah. and it, they just don't forget. I had a – we were – when I was with the Wildlife Agency again, my experience there, we were buying a ranch. And uh, the, the, it was the – uh, fourth generation, and they and they were selling out. They just couldn't do it anymore. But but on the sellout, they were going to go buy a ranch in Buffalo, Wyoming. And great choice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, from where they were in the desert of Utah to go to Buffalo. <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree. But he the this the guy was struggling mightily. He he just didn't want to do it. He just kept backing out and stuff. And and I don't have a lot of wisdom, but he said, you know, I've been here for four generations. And I said, why don't you go to Wyoming and be the first generation in Wyoming? And about two weeks later, he come back. He said, I thought about that. And he said, you're right. He said, I'm going to go be the first generation in Wyoming. You know, and I mean, I, I don't know how that – that just came out, you know. And and he said, I'm, we're going. And they, they sold us a ranch. And I, I think, love Buffalo. Yeah. I lived yeah. there for oh, a yeah. long time when yeah. I started my career with USDA. Yeah. And so I have a, a soft spot for – you know, driving around the big horns, doing resource yeah. work up there. And then um, my the mule deer that hangs in my office um, came The one of, you found? Was he the blind, one blind and he had, to, yeah. had CWD? And no, he had to actually get an interstate game tag because <laughs> he hit it with his truck. 
<laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Work <laughs> truck. <laughs> no, it's like that's uh there's an area up there that will always it'll be my secret spot that I'm not gonna tell people about, but it's it's pretty magical. It requires a little bit of ingenuity. It's all legal, but some ingenuity and some hiking to get into it. Uh, but then once you get into it, pretty you, sweet. you can always find n- n- nice meal. I just don't always have time to get into it yeah. you know, every year because, I mean, I for say, those didn't who, you say a story at the know, beginning here where you said, I don't understand meal Yeah, yeah, I don't understand. Yeah, he was, yeah. Now he's all of a sudden, I know just, this place. <laughs> I just want your information in addition to mine. I want yours too. It brings me to a question. That's that the I kind had. of thing that causes a generational rift yeah. when you're, yeah. when you're uh, disingenuous up front and you really, right. yeah. yeah. Well, fair, Dave. That's fair. <laughs> Says the guy who won't take me goose hunting. But I'm up front about it. <laughs> <laughs> See? Yeah, so, that, that's legitimate. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think legitimately, and maybe, to, I, you know, legitimately, I think mule deer, I think that the, the mule deer are, are cagey. At least they've become cagey. Absolutely. It's, t- it's tough to find, especially the smart ones. Like and those are the big ones, yep. the ones that have been around yep. and they've seen it all. And there's a reason that they're still around. You know, there's a reason that they're getting big, and it's not because the, it is not because they're dumb. Um, so, a lot of people want a deer like that. Yeah, I mean, so many people want a deer like that that there's even become a market for selling information about a deer like that. What do you think? I I think that's unethical. I don't think that should be allowed. I mean. You you said it. You you found a place. You work hard to get there. You know, and for somebody to just profit off of that, I just that to me is unethical. And that's not fair chase. I mean, we have enough technology out there that's given us an advantage over animals. I mean, to to use technology today to say, you know, here's where this deer hangs out and here's this location of its radio collar or whatever. I I personally don't think it's ethical. So yeah. But we don't, as an organization, Mule Deer Foundation, we haven't taken an actual position on that yet. And that's we've got several things that we're putting position papers together on, and technology is one of them. We tend to, because I'm a professional member of Boone and Crockett, is we follow Boone and Crockett on fair chase. And so usually they lead on putting a policy out or something on, on you know, long-range shooting, things like this, you know. Use of radios, all those, all those technology things. So you know, we a lot of times will defer and accept their policy to whatever they come up with. So I know why I'm in game and fish. So years ago, I was one of the the early adopters of the use of GPS because of the job that I had. We had these old military units. I called them pluggers. You ever mm-hmm. seen one of those? Mm-hmm. So yeah, so we're carrying a plugger around. Those big. big oh, you like know, a, I've you seen need them. a backpack yeah. pack thing yeah. almost. Yep. And but then used them ever since. And and when. Uh, I know when Game and Fish started doing radio caller work mm-hmm. and and started getting into GPS work where they could actually they were using you know ArcGIS to track elk movement and to kind of figure things out like migration corridors. Um, there was a big joke where I'd always call the Game and Fish guys and we'd, I'd want to swap some you know some GPS points and ha ha you know. Um, and Wyoming passed. I mean, I believe we had to pass a law right to protect that. The, the the coordinates. So I, I, because people were trying, people were trying, and, and I, I, here's why I'm bringing this up. Yeah, I, and maybe so let me, it's not. Well, important. let me. I can. I think I can explain what. The, the, so the we have laws that prevent you, where where if a public records request comes in from information, the state provides it in the aggregate. So mm-hmm. you, you know they they'll. For example, like with wolves, you can't give out a den location of a wolf, a specific pinpoint. You have a collared wolf. You can't give out a den location. You can give out a regional, regional like this pack covers home range, home range, yeah. right? And you can do. And so when it comes to you know big game too, you're not going to give out a pinpoint. This is this is you know two days ago where this transmission came on this specific animal, but. The aggregate data of this of here's the movement, which is why you see these migration corridor, the, the mapping, and you see here's where where they travel over the course of a year. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll see I've, that you can get that map. I didn't so want to get was, super detailed. No, but but, I, but it's it's sort of a you you they're protecting the fine point, the individual data points from getting into public hands. So you. Because there's a fair chase element to that. Right. Like right. If you well, get I think that, every hunter, so yeah. me as a you know federal government employee, but whether you work for Game and Fish, the federal government, whatever, every hunter, it would 
it doesn't pass the smell test. If I tell – if I would – if they were to say like, how did you know where elk were? And I said, well, I got the radio caller data from Game and Fish. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean Ev- – Everybody would – that would – and yeah. so – but – and that's what to me makes this interesting is because now – because this is now private, you know, we have private individuals who are doing that, basically doing that themselves. I, I, I question throwing that out for this out for the ether. What's the difference? Why would we have a, why would we, you know, why, you know, what we, we, guy A would be unethical, but we don't have a problem with guy B. And I don't, I think that most people do have a problem with guy B, but I think that the technology mm-hmm. is just, it's gotten to the point where the market, this new, this new thing is something that people haven't necessarily seen before. And, you know, we talked with some other folks about it. And here's the other thing, you know, you know, somebody would say, well, how's that different than outfitting? Well, outfitters are, are different because they're regulated by the state. Yeah. Uh, there's a, there's, there's a, a whole set of rules and regulations that govern this. It's not, you know, it's, it's not a free for all. Well, plus the outfitter, and I think I mentioned this before, on, I mean, the outfitter is providing you with the means of transportation and right. the food and the lodging and you know the it's an entire their experience historic knowledge of the and area. their historic knowledge of the area um you know, and but they're not providing you with a gps coordinate of you know where they've been seeing a particular animal and and you know i mean there are so many technology things where that is so take the take a trail cam what's the difference between a trail cam and a gps location you know they're, they're a point in time of when you're seeing an animal and, you know, is, should, should, should trail cams be banned? Should trail cams be banned two weeks before the season? You know, we hear all that, you know, uh, in Nevada, they've got a water hole that had, they had like 25 or 30 trail cams on it. And there were so many people coming to the, to the, to the trail cams, the animals couldn't even get a drink of water. You know, and, and water was the limiting source in that area. And so, you know, Nevada was thinking about banning trail cams, and I think they ended up just saying you can't visit them during a certain time or something. But I don't know what they did. But technology is really, really going to hurt us in society because of the lack of fair chase. I think we're going we're gonna to be our own worst enemy with technology. And I think the general public that doesn't hunt is not going to like that in the long run. But, you know, I mean, right now we're being challenged and different groups are being challenged on long range shooting. And they say, what's your what's your position on that? And and we haven't that's one of those we're developing a position on. But it's like that's an individual choice. I can't tell you not to long range shoot. I don't. I've never shot an animal over 400, 450 yards. And to me, that's that's a long range shot. For yeah, me. and that's a long. Yeah, to you could say I'm unethical from because you, you know you want to shoot at a much shorter. So I, 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 I'm like, that's, ah, that's a putt. I mean, that is really going to be, I think, Gimme. the dilemma that we have going forward as as yeah. the hunting community is is technology more than anything else. Oh, I think we talked to to um, Tony Shunin yesterday, and that's one of the things that we talked about, and I loved his take on it and i totally agree with it the question is are you using this you know this technology um is it does it get you animals you wouldn't have gotten or is it are you using technology in a way that it makes you more ethical and effective at and and better at your craft better at your craft for doing the same thing that you would have done and and that's kind of and i mean i'm struggling to, to describe it because i have a really good idea in my mind of exactly what he's saying and i totally agree with it which is that and i told him as i think every shooter should be able to shoot should be able to shoot steel at a thousand yards and then shoot and and then they should do everything they can to shoot their animal at 10 yeah yeah and because you know to me like that's that's the goal it's that the tools that we use we get so good that we're that we that we're not putting in question whether or not we're going to be able to make an ethical shot but my you know, I I talked about a friend who said, uh, so if you are at more risk of missing than you are of being seen, time to get closer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I agree with that. I I think you I think you should be as proficient as you can before you go in the field. And I, the thing I worry about is technology allows us to be lazy. I agree, and, and that's the big part. I yeah. mean, I mean, you found your spot because you worked to find it you 
there there's a wild, lot of ways we find where we hunt. I, I just don't think that's fair that you go, oh, I'm going to pay a hundred bucks for that so I can know I can go right there. I mean, that's to me part of the hunt is more than the kill yeah. or more than the animal. It's the not knowing. It's the yeah. not knowing. But it's I, yeah. I was telling Nephi on on the drive over to, yeah. to this meeting. One of my the, my drive for continuing to get better is uh, is I like to get out there and you know, for elk hunting in particular, mule deer, finding the track, right, and better understanding animal behavior, so that when I start to see a herd and I start to see the tracks break up a little bit, I can say, okay, I know in about a quarter mile they're going to bed down because mm-hmm. they've started breaking up, and, I, and then I'm looking at the terrain. I'm like. Okay, based on the train, this is where I bet they're going to bed down. And then I think about the wind conditions. I'm like, okay, so if I'm going to, so what do you think about if I'm going to, if I'm going to put a sneak on them, <laughs> based on the the wind conditions, the terrain where I think they're probably going to bed down. Now that I've seen these tracks, this is this is where I need to go mm-hmm. to 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 yeah. make my final assault. Yeah. I mean, and that's the stuff that I want to get better at. The idea right. of of buying a point so I can, you know. Leave at halftime of a football game and go out and shoot my big trophy deer, and come back for the second half. I mean, it, I mean that's the the extreme, but you know the where, where you're yeah. not having that experience yeah. and and really improving that craft and and really getting to know mm-hmm. animal behavior. That's the fun part of hunting. Is Absolutely, getting to know animal behavior. Absolutely, and I think to me it goes both ways when you say there's. You know, two extremes, and and I think, and again, this is just my personal, maybe it's my personal ethic, that you're you're erring if you're going to either side. If you're, you know, I say don't don't poo poo the advancements, and in don't you know, I know I know guys that don't go to the range, and they're proud of it. <laughs> you know, they don't. Yeah. They're like, oh, I don't need to do this. I don't need to do that because I'm gonna. I'm just gonna do. You know, that's not. I don't care about being able to shoot. You know. They, you know, quote unquote long range because it doesn't matter to me. And then, and I know guys on, I don't actually know guys on the other side who would just be like, oh yeah, I'm going to get lazy and fat and, and drive around on a, on a, on a four wheeler. Cause I've got a gun that I'm going to shoot from a mile away at a, I don't know. I don't know those guys, but I know that those two paradigms exist. That really, I just think that we as a hunting community, the the healthy thing for us in terms of moving forward is to just if we are seen as guys who literally like, look, we love animals and we all love animals. And you know what? We are going to be absolutely the best at our craft. Like we are the next generation of hunters. We're going to be, we're going to be, we are the best at, at this that there is. We are, we, we are always getting better at our, at our craft, at our field craft. We're always working on our ability to ethically take an animal in the, in, you know, one shot, like, that's who I, to me. That's that's what we should be. But but I got to tell you, I think I've seen a, a different shift in our hunter. Though I think a lot of our hunters, social media has put so much pressure on us killing a big deer, a big elk, a big whatever. So I can show my photo, naming animals, you know, scouting them all year, and then you know, and there's so much pressure to be one to harvest. But not to just go out and shoot a two-point deer for meat. It's if I don't come home with a big deer, I've failed. Well, and actually, if you shoot that two-point deer, you're, you're you're criticized. You're criticized. Yeah, and that's I don't like that trend in our society. And I see that with all these chat rooms and social media and all that. That you know that, and, and I I hate naming a deer. You know, I hate that they big buck has got ended up gets a name and. You know, because then we're trying to humanize them, you know, and stuff. Yeah. But, but I, I just think there's so much pressure there, and 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 you see that, and and some people also get back to that's why guys pay all this big money is they don't want to do what yeah. we're just talking about. They want to go out, have somebody show them, shoot that animal, and go home, you know, and and stuff. But I I worry about that. I really do worry that that. That because we're so enamored with those big animals and so much pressure, that we're going to lose the public support because we're shooting trophies or we're shooting antlers, and that's all we're thinking about. We're not thinking about you know the organic food, the you know the food that. And that's where gonna, the public support is. That's and that's I, where I mean, the support. The seventy-five percent of the yep. public that supports hunting. 
when you break down the numbers, they support hunting for food. Right. Exactly right. Yeah. I think that Steve... So post pictures of of your deer steak. Yeah. 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 That's exactly right. I I hope that the pendulum is swinging back. I think that, you know, Steve Ranello deserves a lot of credit for his approach to it because I think that he... I, I think of him as a pragmatist. And here's where I worry... I think that there's people in who see him and would and would try and drag him the other direction sure. to being some kind of a you know some kind of a I don't know it's the right word you know help me like a lefty <laughs> like but I mean to me he's no I like to see you struggle I'm, I'm yeah, just yeah. gonna let you yeah, work. Okay, yeah. just to, to me, let you try to dig you for this hang word. yourself you yeah. know yeah. <laughs> to me this attitude I'm just is, gawking at this point <laughs> can he pull this off can yeah, he do it <laughs> to me the to me the direction that he goes is right. You can tell that, you know, he's a friend. And I think that when he, you know, he uh, loves mule deer. Absolutely, and, yeah. And there was a, he did an episode where he actually got like a, a big muley and he hadn't before. And and he he's not a grip and grin guy, but he was very proudly <laughs> sitting behind that and taking a picture. But you knew how much work he had put into that. Yeah. The, the lifetime of work right. he had put into finding that one right. and the amount of, you know, button bucks and does that have gone in his freezer. Yeah. Um, you know, I, that's right. Yeah. I think that that is, that is right. That is, yeah. the, that is the right way for a hunter. It's a personal voyage. It's striving to get there. It's working. And when you hang that trophy in your office, that trophy, I hope, represents not just a, a dollar amount. And a uh, and a and a and a and a and a and a push of a mouse button or something like that. But I hope it represents a lifetime of trying to get better yeah. and striving for that. Because when you look at that, what's the value of that? Yeah, like that is that's the irreplaceable trophy. That's something that you look at and you're like, wow, the value of that you could never pay for it. Right, you could never pay for it because it's so many experiences and it's so much. You know, heartache and sweat and blisters and carrying and that, you know, nobody can ever buy that. And it doesn't matter how big the rack is. No one will ever purchase it. You know, and that, and you're right. And, you know, I remember as a kid when we would go out and deer hunt, we'd come back and hang the deer in the garage and cut the antlers off and throw them up in the, up in the rafters of the garage. And we never even thought about a grip and grin. Of course, the cameras we had back then were, but I mean, it was, we were doing it for the meat. We were doing it for the, for the family social. Everybody was getting together and doing it. We weren't, I don't ever remember everybody bragging that he had a bigger deer than somebody else, you know? So, you know, the deer, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to show you a picture here. Okay. This Leave is it the, to Dave. This yeah. is, no, this is the deer. <laughs> this is the deer I'm most proud of. I've been hunting deer for, oh, I don't know now. I, can't At even least do the two math. Years. 20, two years. 26 yeah. years, something like that. Yeah. Um, I've, I've killed a lot of mule deer. I've killed some really nice bucks. This is the mule deer I'm most proud of, and I think you'll know why when you yeah. see the picture. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. you're exactly right. Um, it's a yep. it's a four-corn mule yep. deer, yep. but I've got my two young daughters on either side of it. And they're like... And they were over the moon to be there to see that yep. happen. Um, you know, and it that's... That was my most proud mule deer because I had my my two yeah. daughters with me, and they got to experience the whole thing. That's, and that's and exactly right. And those, I mean, talking about making memories that last a lifetime. Those those are the kind, whether you have the photo or not. You know, I mean, that's what I remember hunting with my family. You know, when I was young and I was just brushing, they wouldn't. I wasn't old enough to carry a gun. You know, but yet those were some of the, my best memories of of the hunts that we went on, you know, and, and then when the day I finally got to carry a gun and it was, and you'll appreciate this. So I think it was a, a, a 308 Savage lever action. Uh, that's what I like. No, Savage no, 99. No, Savage no, 99. no scope, you know, and I, yep. I, you know, if I, I don't remember ever killing a deer with it, and, you know, I'm, but, but you know, <laughs> you know, those are the things you remember, you know, and, and sitting in the back of a pickup and after a, after a, a hunt and, Talking about the one that got away, you know, and the one that snuck out behind you, and stuff like that, and that—that's—that's that's what it's about. You know, it's funny. Uh, I just pick on this because I love. So that—that that is a Savage Model ninety nine. I have a Winchester Model eighty eight and three hundred eight. Was my grandfather's rifle. It was my first rifle yeah. that I ever carried. It is the rifle that I carried when I when I shot my first mule deer, which was the first big game animal I ever took when I was in high school, 
And, uh, you know, and that, uh, uh, the reason that is so special to me is because I remember my grandfather, who's no longer like, I, I was yeah. on a, uh, I was on a Mormon mission in Brazil when my grandfather passed away. Mm. That was his gun. And it's it's in my safe right now, and it's something I'll probably it's just something that I hold dear, and and yeah. and it's and when you and whether it's looking at that gun, I think is analogous to, to me to looking, yeah, like kind of like a trophy, like yeah, to those for people that don't understand, it's it's not just an animal, right? It's not a gun, yeah. It represents those it, it, those those talismans that we have represent experiences and people and. Uh, and again, to us, it's it's a it's a part of a memory that will you know that nobody yeah. can ever take away, and will always shape your life. Yeah. And that's to me, that's why I hope we get past you know it, it can't be about number of inches on a on an elk. It's got to be about that experience. And people need to understand that who understand you know who want to talk bad about trophy hunting that it's 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 not a number and, yeah. and we need to our community needs to keep that in mind and that's i think that's the danger and when you you know make these things too simple and you start selling an animal to somebody yeah like then, then you lose all that yeah i mean i i think you're right those memories and and taking your your daughter's hunting that's really what we've got to get back to we've got to make i mean i'm so glad to see young people and women coming into our sport into concert hunting more and more and and making it more about a family experience versus i'm this big macho guy that's you know either put out a trail cam and went and checked it 40 times you know all by myself you know never ever you know don't don't tell your buddy where you killed your animal, Dave. I, I mean, I only have one spot like yeah, that. Yeah, I only have I mean, one yeah. spot. Well, like everybody that. should have one. <laughs> yeah. But but you know, I've taken uh, a lot of people out <laughs> hunting. <laughs> but but the fact is is uh, I, we've got we've got to get back to that. Else we're going to lose it. We're going to lose the sport. I mean, you know, we don't want to get into politics, but who 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 are they saying are going to win this next election? Suburban soccer moms, you know. And if we lose them, you know, I mean, they're the ones now starting to have issues. We should be bringing them into the sport, you know, and being in a family affair. So, uh, can I steal about ten more minutes of your time? You can all you want. Fantastic. I so I mean this this conversation is amazing. I also want to talk. I feel like we missed a piece of the Mule Deer Foundation. Okay. All right. And. and and it'll probably spill into a couple more things, but I'm, you know, we talked about all the, you know, the bank with the fundraising, you know, how you were turning the organization around, but we haven't actually talked about the, the conservation piece that you do on the, on the ground stuff. You talked about the government affairs side right. and, and right. how important those relationships are and the, and the impacting policy. And, but I'm, I'm curious the type of work that the foundation does. Sure. Um, for Habitat and for Mule Deer? You know, when I first came in and we talked about, you know, the project, we were, you know, as you've heard this before, we were doing a lot of random acts of kindness. We were doing little dinky projects. And so, you know, it wasn't until about uh, seven or eight years ago uh, that I was able to start looking at landscape-type initiatives. And um, it's interesting how, how things come back around. When I was with the state, I went to an NWTF turkey hunt in Oklahoma and the gist was they had several of us there from state agencies talking about stewardship program in the forest service and uh and I thought ah this is nice great you know well you know fast forward to to when I started looking I thought I remember that and I remember that now we're we're looking at you know a lot of things with mule deer we've always said winter range is the limiting factor uh you know highway mortality all that but I was really seeing that summer range was – they were coming off the summer range in bad condition. Uh, a lot of uh, Dr. Monty's studies in Wyoming on the migration corridor, a lot of those deer coming off sometimes off the forest didn't have any fat, fat buildup from the year. And we, and we were seeing a lot, a lot of that uh, in other studies. And, and so I said we've got to do something at the landscape scale. And so we started a stewardship project, which is – incredibly accelerated the last couple of years. We're working uh, uh, almost all the Western states. Uh, California, with their wildfire problems, believe it or not, is leading the nation in this. Their CAL FIRE and the Forest Service are giving us 
lots and lots of money to go in and try to treat these forests. They're looking at it from from a healthy forest standpoint of of protecting their watersheds, protecting their communities. We're looking at it as improving mule deer and blacktail deer habitat, and so and we're doing this all over the West, uh, the Kaibab, uh, and uh, in Utah, Montana, Idaho, uh, Wyoming. We're we're doing these projects, and so the, we're trying to do things at a much bigger scale. That takes partners. And in this case, Forest Service, but Elk Foundation, Turkey Federation, all of us are, are going together to look at this at a, at a landscape scale so we can make a difference. And then, of course, the migration corridor stuff that's come along in the last two years since the secretarial order and building on what Wyoming has done there. And we're now, now looking at migration corridors on a landscape scale, a west-wide scale, because a lot of these mule deer herds are interstate. And you know, I'm an old state guy, but I didn't care what Colorado did. I didn't care what Wyoming did. I didn't care what Idaho did when they surrounded us. But – and those states, you know, in some ways they don't. They get together for an interagency meeting once a year. But a lot of these herds are interstate, and that really fascinates me that we've got to got to figure out how to how to keep that uh, – those migration corridors intact and stuff. So, so those are some of the – we're starting – you know, we're still doing habitat projects. The other thing that we just got just come out in the Federal Register was a cat X for pinion juniper removal. You know, pinion juniper has invaded the West like you can't believe. I mean, I think I saw BLM said there's 74 million acres of pinion juniper. When settlers first come to the West, there wasn't much pinion, relatively, pinion juniper. It's an invasive plant. And so with this cat X that's being uh finished up by BLM, it'll help accelerate our BLM work uh, on removing pinion juniper, which is good. And, and the bill we got passed, uh, that was our our bill that Senator Hatch and Senator Heinrich uh, passed in the farm bill was uh, we, we titled it sage grouse and mule deer. Yep. And so we put sage grouse first because of their focal yep. and how much they could impact the West. But you know, we know that the pinion juniper impacts sage grouse. Well, it impacts mule deer and the fact that, yeah, it gives it thermal cover. And we have a lot of discussions with, with biologists, but, but we've lost a lot of good sagebrush habitat, a lot of good habitat by pinion juniper invading into the, into the flats and stuff. So, so that's a big, huge push of ours is to, to, to try to stem the tide of, of pinion juniper invasion. And, and with climate change, whether you believe in it or not, is, uh, pinion junipers invading because the west is drying up and they got those big deep to- tap roots and they can they can get they can expand where sagebrush is very drought can be killed by drought so uh, but those are some of the big initiatives that we're talking about we still do local projects we we uh in montana our license plate money we always put that into a rocky mountain elk foundation montana fish wildlife and parks uh purchase or conservation easement that money's dedicated to that because we want to keep working lands working one of the things a lot of people forget in the west is private lands are the key to wildlife yeah if yeah, you if, if you if you don't have private land they spend a lot wildlife spend a lot of time on private land and we got to keep those those working lands working and we also got to work on getting access working with the landowners in North Dakota, we've been able to open almost uh, 75,000 acres of private land to hunting. We go in and work with the landowner in their in their program, and it's called PLOTS, Public Land Opportunity something. I can't remember the acronym, but, but it's their access program. And, and we've been able to work with the landowners, go in and help them do habitat projects, take out old fences and stuff, things like that, and and – We've been able to open up a lot of areas to access, so access is a big issue for us too. So those are some of the big land, big picture things we're doing. Of course, we always do small local projects too. But that's but, awesome. Yeah, and it, and and it, we're all about partners. Yeah. We're not big enough to do it ourselves. We're not one of the big boys that's got a big trust fund or yeah. or big grants. But we're we have to do it with yeah. other partners. I, my my background with USDA ultimately, you know, the formative part was watershed level planning yeah we're getting partners together to do conservation yeah. on these large landscape scales it's just absolutely critical if you, you got to be able to get people around the table and they may not always agree on all the issues but if you can't get 
these larger scale plans together and get built. I mean, that's really where the rubber hits the road. The other thing, you know, you mentioned something that Dave and I argued about in the truck. Um, on, oh, <laughs> on you're not going to do this, are I am. you? But I think, no, but this, I think we, need, we, have like, no, this, we don't have seven point. hours. There's a point to this. <laughs> no, it's funny. Like, there's a lot of discussion. I mean, you kind of you said like whether you believe in it or not, you know, climate change. And I think, unfortunately, there are a number of issues that this could be. We could use this as a kind of a, a straw man to stand in for it, where there's too much blaming. Yeah. Instead of mitigating. Yeah. And that's the funny part. A lot of these issues, people get around and they want to argue about the budget. They yeah. want to argue about who's responsible for what rather than saying, hey, you know what? If we could all just sit here for a second, we probably all agree we have a problem. Yeah. And it doesn't. So rather than arguing about who's responsible for which part of the budget, why don't we just work on mitigating the problem? And and unfortunately, in the world today, nobody wants to do that. They want to argue about the budget rather than get down to the brass tacks of fixing the problem. And and yeah. and the reality is, um, we probably all think a lot more alike on fixing these problems than people would be led to believe if we only concentrated on the things that are you know the differences of opinion on on how we got somewhere. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I mean. We're seeing a lot of change in, in what's going on in, in the West, in the weather. And, you know, I, I don't – I'm not going to, you know, get on It doesn't matter, the, right? Yeah, what, doesn't who, matter. What's causing it? It's it's happening. Yeah. And and we just got to say what can we do in our little part of the world and in what we can do and have control over. What can we do to help, yeah. you know, put this back or, or you know, try to try to slow yeah. it down. Well, how can we create a viable path right. forward that's good right. for the things that we love? Yeah. And that's so, important. you know, I mean, those are the kind of things I see. Yeah. The, is the fire season longer and hotter and drier than we've had in the past? Yes. But part of it is we've not managed our forests. Yeah. We've kept our hands off our national forests, and they're not in good condition. They can't withstand the fire, so they blow through. Pinion juniper invading. Uh, in Nevada, it 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 burns a million acres of pinion juniper. What's it come back to? Cheatgrass, which is not valuable for anybody except a little teeny bit in the spring when it greens up, you but, know? And that's where the landscape level work that you talked about yeah. is so critical. Right. Because it is in that landscape level discussions of conservation and need that you, you're forced to kind of, you know, you're forced to kind of concentrate on the whole picture. Right. And what we can do. To fix the whole picture, and that never ends up being like, well, that's Dave's fault, and that's Nefa's fault, and that ends up being a much more, you know, a nuanced discussion that requires consensus building and pragmatism. Which, hey, Frank, let's, let's be honest, that's not popular right now. Yeah, but it doesn't matter if it's popular; yeah. Yeah. it's what's right. Yeah, and and that, you know, that's why I, we got to go back to we've got to get together. We got to do these partnerships and work together. And leverage our dollars. I mean, none of us have enough money to fix this. But if we can leverage our dollars, we can have an impact in a watershed, in a local community, in a county, you know, somewhere or, you know. And so – and I think I think the other thing that I've learned more as we go along, I have to be more strategic in where I spend our dollars or where we partner with. You know, it used to be I tried to put a little bit of money everywhere again, get that name out, get that credibility back that you're a viable partner. But now a lot, I get a lot of projects that come to me and I go, you know, I don't see that as, as a high priority. And it's hard to tell somebody that they're not a high priority, you know, that, hey, I've got other priorities. And I think that it'd be better if we spent the money over here rather than over over here and and you know i mean i've i've done enough habitat projects and grants to know that you know you don't always win you know you don't always get your funding and don't get mad you know but just make your project better mm -hmm. find a way to make it more appealing and and either more uh you know bring more partners to the table or bring you know do it at a bigger scale or or retweak it and so you know that's what i always try to tell people is and I, you know, I just tell everybody I can't fund everything. You know, no, I don't have enough money to do that. And so you have to really be strategic and and stuff. So, but uh, uh, definitely, you know, uh, you know, our organization. You go back to Mule Deer Foundation. My philosophy is is that the state wildlife agencies, the federal government, are our partners, and the private landowners are our partners. And we and I and part of my responsibility is educating a lot of our members that don't understand that. 
And that that's huge because a lot of people have lost that connection to the land. Well, you know, they just take public land for granted, and sometimes they curse the private landowner. And you just have to take a lot of time to say, no, 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 it's all connected. Yeah. It's, it's all there. The, so. the private landowner, we, we harp on this <clears throat> a lot. Like, There's a reason why the private land is so incredibly important, and it's because that's where all the water is. <laughs> that in was the, the West. Yeah. In the West, that's where people uh, yeah. thought, okay, yeah. we can make a living here because yep. there's water. Yep. And so we have all this public land. And a good portion of it is really dry. Mm-hmm. And you need that private land to survive. It's mm-hmm. it's transition habitat. It might be winter range. It's it's all sorts of stuff. It's part right. of the whole. Right. Um, yeah. So that's we we're talking all the time about okay, what are the consequences if if we don't support uh, the private landowner? And it's they become that guy in Utah that fourth generation that mm-hmm. can't make a go anymore mm-hmm. and has to sell. Yeah. And and this one, he was fortunate enough to be able to move to Wyoming and buy a piece of property, but a lot of them aren't. They right. sell, right. and who do they sell to? It's somebody else that can't come in and make a living off the land. They're coming in, and they'll subdivide. And and yeah. now you have all these houses fragmenting or, the habitat. Or, or completely closing it off and not raising livestock or cattle and, and, yeah. and just Hobby shut, farm. Yeah, yeah. shutting it down, you know, and access is lost. They don't, you know, the worst, the one thing, I go back to my, when I was working for the state wildlife agency, we had a lot of wildlife management areas we bought. Sometimes they were the worst managed property in the county. And I, and, and so we worked hard to budget money to get them back into shape. Some of them to get back into agriculture. Because when you take a land out of production, it becomes a weed patch and it's not valuable to wildlife or or anything else, you know, and I, people don't understand that, yeah. that, that you've, you've got to manage the land. Just being natural and leave it alone doesn't always work, doesn't no. always make it the best wildlife habitat. Yeah, in fact, it rarely does. It rarely does. I, uh, so i got to ask you another one. I have, yeah. I have like two more questions is all, and maybe you have a million. Mom. But I, have to, I, I, I kind of view you as a, uh, as a perpetual optimist through all the challenges <laughs> you have. You always just have this this really optimistic outlook on, on just about everything. Um, and I know mule deer have been struggling. Uh, it, it, you talked about the, the growing up during the, mm-hmm. the golden age of mule deer, and recently mule deer have really been struggling in, in places around the West. And uh, uh, you know, it's two part, This part's a two-part question. It's, one is, do you have a sense why? And two, uh, you know, thinking about the future... Of mule deer, you think the future is bright, or or do we have reason to be concerned long term? I, you know, if you look back as and some of the things I talked about with the predator control and the, and the, just the way the West looked during the heyday of mule deer, things were much different, and and so to me, in some ways, that was almost artificial. It wasn't the true carrying capacity of the West for mule deer. And 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 also one of the things that I don't think people realize, and a lot of people don't like me to say this, but the in, the, the increase of elk on the landscape has forced mule deer sometimes into more uh, marginal habitat, and in some areas, mule, white tails coming in from the east. Even though mule deer are in a lot of different habitat types, and 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 you think these things could survive anywhere. They're actually quite fragile and limited in, in, in the, what can impact them. And so I, I, I think historically our, our numbers were artificial and we'll never be back there. And I've accepted that fact and that's not negative. It's just we're never going to physically be there. So where are we today? When I started mule deer 14 years ago, mule deer were almost were universally at their low. A few states had a few bright spots. I think Wyoming was still quite high and some others, Idaho maybe. But but when I came, we were kind of in that trough, that bottoming out. And I feel because things like the sage-grouse issue and what we've been able to do there, when they, you know, the, the increase in, in funding for sage-grouse have benefited mule deer. CRP benefits mule deer. All these things have benefited mule deer. We're seeing them either stabilize or go, you know, start to come back up. So I'm optimistic that we'll always have mule deer. 
Now, where that level will balance uh, depends on how much more development we get in the West. But but things like now putting wildlife crossings in, which are saving thousands and thousands of deer, uh, I think are going to help that. Um, I worry about, you know, the lack of predator control because a lot of states are, you know, not allowing that. But a lot there's a lot of pressure on mule deer. But I am optimistic that we'll always have mule deer. We'll always have huntable numbers. Now, where that number is, I don't. That's going to vary, because you take Wyoming or Utah or Idaho has a really hard winter. You can lose deer pretty quickly. They're pretty fragile that way. You take Arizona and New Mexico; they go into a drought. Southern Utah, Southern Colorado, they're they're really can impact those populations. So you're going to see them maybe the ups and downs. But I'm I'm positive that that there's a, the future's maybe not you know like i say we're not going to be back to those historic numbers but i i think we'll always have good mule deer herds to hunt and i'm and i think a lot of that's been our work our partners work a lot of people t- paying attention the one thing that worries me about state wildlife agencies is during the pr bump which you nephi you know very well all that money that came in a lot of these states kind of forgot about deer and elk and antelope and moose and st- we're doing a lot of other things with with their funding when that pr number goes down which it's starting to go down now they're going to find out how many deer and elk licenses they've lost and hunters they've lost and i i think they haven't taken care of their customers and i talk to state directors about that all the time and i worry i i I think that that's the one negative thing i see that could impact deer numbers and stuff is the agencies i think are are could be struggling if if they don't pay attention to what they're doing and PR funding and license sales that's a whole nother mm-hmm. we could talk about that for another it makes it feel hour. better what's up it, there's going to be another slug that'll come in this year is up twenty percent good good so, so wildlife agencies use it wisely use it widely and pay attention to your big game animals because that's I you know I just I mean there's a couple states and I won't mention them Oregon Washington that. I forgot about big game. And I would like to remind <laughs> I would like to remind everybody and you're right. I would like to remind everybody that if you go to Walmart and you can't find any toilet paper, you can always buy a gun. You can always buy a gun. And ammunition. And ammunition. Yeah. And you should. And a license. Because, and a and license. license. Yeah. Because if coronavirus keeps up, yep. you're going to run out of toilet paper, but you're but that firearm will be a keepsake forever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, and and you know, I, I tell people, uh, you know, if you want to go down and get all of all the shelves food, I've got. I had twelve deer walk through my yard the other day. I know what I. We're all be. You're gonna survive. I'll be a protein guy, but I know what I'm gonna survive. I'm on Atkins, but uh, I, I, yeah, I may. I may need to go out and get some leaves in the backyard for, but. but uh, but uh, you know, I'll I'll survive, you know, because I have guns and ammunition, and I know how to hunt, you know. So, <laughs> and and to be, uh, you know, to be fair to the agencies, um, they're in a tough spot. They are they in have, a tough you spot. You know, they have they have limited resources. Some of their legislatures, yep. you know, I can, you know, Wyoming in particular is one where the legislature has cut off all general fund dollars mm-hmm. to the agency, uh, and they still have their statutory directive to manage for all wildlife, uh, and and they serve. You know, as much as we we you know like to hope that we're the number as hunters that we're the main constituency and we want the agency to serve our needs. At the end of the day, they have a constituency of yeah. of all the people right. and all of the wildlife, and you know, legislatures aren't being as friendly to them about providing money. Right. And then you've got you have dips in PR. It's nice to hear that that revenue yeah. is going to spike, but you have hunter numbers in a lot of states decreasing which means lower revenue streams right. from coming in from license sales and it's just this convergence of difficult factors to to be able to get the appropriate resources to to meet all of the needs of yeah. the agency they're and, in, so they're in a tough spot yeah and 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 we're adding cooperative biologists and pheasants forever does this and some of the other other groups is they've got the pr money they don't have the match that they don't have that that those license dollars or general yep. fund dollars. So that's where groups like ours are coming in and saying, okay, we can be the match. We can yep. either, you know, be 50% or seven or 25% because sometimes PR is 75, 25. So we're getting a lot of co-op biologists around and that's also helping because that's focusing when we hire them. We say, look, I'm, this is this person's got to focus on, on big game yeah. and mule deer and specifically. And so, uh, 
you know, and work on habitat projects that benefit that. So, so that is, that is a, a bright spot, uh, that for us as an organization, as we expand our biological staff, our expertise, where the, you know, they come to us, they're against an FTE cap. Uh, we can hire the person or they can hire the person. We can give them money. They can give us some money. And that, that's, that's where I'm saying there are partners and we do a lot of that. Yeah. And this is, I know I'm going to drag us longer, but just, so everyone understands with the PR dollar issues, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, the, this, you know, PR and where it comes from, but increasingly remember 80% of those PR dollars aren't coming from the hunting community. That actually creates a unique problem. Right. And the problem that it creates is that hunting community, those hunters who are buying licenses, you got to have that other money coming into the state in order to match Pittman Robertson. Right. Because you could have a bajillion dollars out there in Pittman Robertson because everybody's sport shooting. But the way that it's built in order for the state wildlife agencies to leverage that P those PR dollars, yeah. they got to be getting money from another source right. too. And that's why from the wild, like from a hunting perspective, agencies need to remember, you know, both of those things because the most, I, I, you know, I heard somebody say the other day, the most endangered species that uh, that the, that the, the critical endangered species that hunting aid, that that wildlife management agencies need to be concerned about is their customer. Yeah, yeah. Because if you don't have that, yeah. if you're not meeting that customer need, meaning the sportsman, um, it all goes away. Yeah, and I and I and that's one of the things I think the state is has to learn that 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 they're a business. I mean, they have a mandate to 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 manage all wildlife, but they also have a business component that sometimes I think they forget, you know, and, and they've got to realize that, you know, if I'm going to, if I'm going to keep my doors open, I've got customers that I need to keep happy. I need to build that customer base, you know, and just adding, you know, I mean, to me, license, a, li a, a hunting license in the state, still the cheapest thing you can buy, you know, go to a movie, go skiing, go anything. But, you know, you just can't continue to just raise licenses all the time. You've got to have a product that people want. Yeah. And so yet that, that takes, you know, taking care of business. You have to build a customer base. Yeah. Well, yeah. and you have to invest in your product. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly right. Yeah. yeah. If you if you ignore your product, which some of the states have, and, you know, and, and I understand, you know, uh, some of the issues in some of these states. And as we get hunters become a less percentage of the population – there's even going to be more more pressure on those agencies to do other things, you know. So. Well, that's sort of a a bummer of a thing to end uh, to end on. So at least I have one more question to okay. bring this back up in, okay. in real positive All terms. Right. Right. Um, so if, for the folks that listen, they know what's coming next. You, you, I don't know if you listen. You might not know what's coming you, next. You know, I have to yeah. admit, I've never listened to to to, to you guys. I've, I will change that. Not for just me, but you're lucky yeah. because when you're quarantined, <laughs> yeah, there's there, there you go. over eighty episodes. There you, can you listen go. To now. Okay, I've listened to your podcast. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just so as it makes you feel good, I haven't wa listened to On Gravel podcast either yet. So Never. That actually, that actually does make me feel a little better. It makes me feel quite a bit better, actually. Actually, now I'm feeling real good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so we do this thing at the end of all, all of our podcasts. So every every guest that comes on, you know, this is the it's the Your Mountain podcast, and we're talking about you know issues relating to land, wild wa uh, water, and wildlife. And we like to hear from everybody. Um, you know, we want to know that special place that that you know metaphorical or actual place that that drives you that that you know drives your passion for the outdoors and for conservation and. You know, maybe it was someplace as a kid. Maybe it's someplace today. But it's it's really we want to know what's what's your mountain. I I probably have a couple. I have two. I'll, I'll and I won't go with long. Um, as a kid growing up in Southwest Wyoming, I I I, I tell people I, I I don't know if I'd want to live there because of the hard winters there that we used to have. But but that that was a very special place and 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 a little town called Carter, Wyoming. Um, Railroad town, just mostly a ghost town now. That th growing up there and just going back there, that's a very, very special place. That and and the surrounding sagebrush community. That's where I learned to love sagebrush, and learned to love being out and going out into the des into 
the sagebrush community around there and and hunting prairie dogs and and everything else as as a kid that that is that's always my go to place uh and and Wyoming in general holds holds a big place in my heart there is one really really special place for me I spent 8 years running the green in the Colorado rivers uh doing endangered fish work bald eagles peregrine falcons when I was a non game guy there's an old story that the confluence of the green and the Colorado in, in the Indian lore is the center of the universe, and that is a really special place. When you're at the confluence of the green and the Colorado rivers in Cataract Canyon in Canyonlands National Park, there's just something really, really special about that place, and I've camped there and netted fish and been there many, many times. There's just something when I'm there that, that just gives you peace. And I don't know, I can't explain that because I've never experienced that any other way like there. And the only time it's disturbed is when one of those darn jet boats come by with a bunch of tourists. But when they're gone, that's just, just something really special right there. So that's kind of my my two places. I think that's awesome. I love it. It's my favorite part of every episode is when I get to hear people's mountain. Yeah. I just love it. Yeah. So, so thank you for sharing those. Yeah. Really yeah. appreciate no. it. No, they are. And. Thanks for spending all this time with us. No, this is great. I, mean, I love to talk. So, <laughs> <laughs> like you've got great stories, and it's uh, it's hard for me, but to talk. I I, I am going to write a book. I think I am going to write a book. Are you? Yeah, I think I am about my experiences, and I, and I may never publish it, but but I've had enough people tell me, "Wow, that's really cool." You've done. I mean, I I used to tell people, I for my through my whole career, even with Mule Deer, I can't believe they pay me to do what I do. You know, I, I would do it for free if I could afford it. <laughs> yeah. Don't say that too loudly. They might make you. <laughs> yeah, so. uh, well, make sure you let us know when that uh, when that book is done. You yeah. said you may not publish it, but I think you'll publish it. Yeah, I, I, I might. Should. Now I might, it's you're yeah. on the record that you're I might, doing this. And... I'm, I've thought more and more about that. I uh, I I know we got to go, but interesting experience or expo. Um, there's an author, and he doesn't go by his real name, Jack Carr, and, and he's writ, written a book called The Terminal List. And a couple other books, and they're going to make it in a Netflix series. And I got talking to him backstage, and and he he basically writes about his experience as a Navy SEAL and everything in these books. And in fact, they're they're redacted because sometimes he says things that are still classified. And so they actually there's black. He left the black lines in the book, but he and he says he says write your story, write your story. He says you never know. So. Um, uh, that's kind of why I thought about doing that. So that's good advice, and I hope yeah. you do because I. Yeah. I like your stories. And, so, uh, appreciate it. And I, and I just have so much respect for you and everything you've done. And, well, thank you. Uh, and appreciate yeah. you know, all the time you spent with us today. Well, I know the future's bright with you, too. I, you guys got a long time left, and guys like you are, I know we're in good hands. So, Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, that's so. nice of you to say whether you mean it or not. It's really nice no, of you I to do, say. I do mean it. I, do mean it. <laughs> I, I, I mean, there's a few people out there that I see are are super, super bright spots, and you guys are there. So, Well, thanks so much. That means a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, for everybody out there listening, thanks so much for, for joining us. Uh, if you have feedback for us, please you know, send us an email at yourmountain at itsyourmountain.com. Find us on social media. Share our pages, our Facebook page. You know, If you haven't liked us yet out there, get out and like us. Share us with your friends. Let's, let's, uh, let's, build, let's build this thing. We're at uh, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter at the handle at It's Your Mountain. And leave us that rating where you find this podcast. We'd really appreciate that. Uh it's the it's the fuel that keeps us going to know that you that you appreciate what we're putting out. Um We take envelopes of cash, but we're finding difficult ways to Yeah, you know, we haven't had we've asked for those envelopes of cash, no one's ever sent them. No. Uh if you want to, we'll give you our we'll give you a PO box number. We have one. We have we have one. We've we check it all the time, it. but it, maybe it's full of cash. <laughs> uh anyway. Thanks everybody for uh for tuning in. Uh really this has been a special one for us. So uh again, thanks Miles and okay. uh to everybody out there, just remember Life is about experiences, so go have one.